In the Brewlosophy Triangle test, we present three cups of beer, two identical and one different. Each taster's challenge is to identify the odd one out. We've conducted this test hundreds of times, but what's the rationale behind it? Marshall Schott, founder of Brewlosophy, joins us to explain. And also, who do you think excels more at spotting the difference? BJCP certified judges or regular beer drinkers? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Delta Brewing Systems. More on them in a bit. My name is Marshall Schott. I started Brewlosity back in 2014 uh, with just a website where we would regularly publish experiment results. Uh, and over the years, we've uh, in introduced uh, the Brewlosity podcast, the Brew Lab podcast, and most recently, the Brewlosity show. What is a triangle test and why do we do it? The triangle test is a sensory discrimination test that allows us to determine with some level of confidence whether there is a difference between two different things. Uh, and the way that it works, again, very basic, is that a, a taster or a panel of tasters are served three beers, two of which are exactly the same and one that's different. And they're asked to try to identify the one that is different. Uh, the idea behind a triangle test is that if enough people are capable of identifying the unique sample out of the three, again, two are identical, one is different, then we can say with some level of confidence based on a statistic that we run, uh, an equation that we run, that the, the variable that we are testing seemed to have a perceptible impact. Right. And the, the thing that we are testing are typically our experiment series, right, where we are isolating two beers down to a single variable difference between the two and see if we can tell from that. For the most part, that is what our focus has been um, and is, is that we're, we're doing our best to isolate very specific variables, things that a lot of brewers view as being imperative or crucial to the production of, of quality beer. Um, we're taking it, isolating it down as, as cleanly as we can, and then uh, it, brewing one beer where that variable is in play and another where it's not, and then having tasters perform the triangle test to determine uh, you know, how big of a perceptible, perceptible impact does that variable seem to have? All right. So I have a couple of questions about why triangle tests are done the way that they are done. So the first question is, why do we use three cups and not just two? Because we're testing two beers here. So I give you beer sample A, beer sample B. I try them both and I tell you if I think they taste the same or are different. Well, for one, that wouldn't be a triangle test. <laughs> that, would be the, that would be a linear test, I suppose. But uh, when you have somebody comparing two different things, there's the assumption of a difference, and that assumption of a difference can actually uh, bias a taster. Uh, and that's not what we're necessarily looking for. What we're looking to determine, it, again, is does this variable have an impact? And so when we serve people three beers where two are identical, it's possible that they're going to pick the, or the one that they pick is, is not the different one. And so that gives us some level of information as to just how big of an impact the variable actually has. Right. And having done many triangle tests myself, I know that if I take two beers and I can swear up and down that I think one is different to the other, uh, and I could say, yeah, sample B and sample A, they're not the same, I'm sure of it. But if you test me with three and two of those things or one are different, that is actual proof of me not just thinking I can tell a difference, but actually proving I can tell a difference, right? Or that you can't tell a difference, <laughs> which is more, probably more common. Now I have hundreds of red, green, and blue cups in a closet at home. Why do I have those and I can't just use clear cups? <laughs> That's a good question. You could effectively use clear glasses if you wanted to for a triangle test. Two things about the colored cups. One is when we're performing a triangle test, it's a lot easier if the person taking it has a very identifiable thing to choose from. Uh, if you're using all clear cups, then you have to use your own creativity to come up with a way to delineate each of those three cups. But the other thing is, that we are not focused on the perceptible impact or the the visual impact of uh, the you know what of these variables that we're testing. That's not what we're interested in. If you know fermenting or if, if brewing a beer with wheat malt, for example, has some impact on the way a beer looks, but it doesn't on the way it tastes, smells, or feels in our mouth. What we want is does it have a perceptible impact in terms of flavor, aroma, or mouthfeel? And so that's why we try to cover up the appearance of the beers in the triangle test. Okay, so let's talk about some of the statistical sides of this. Now, there's three cups. I've got to pick one as being the odd beer out. So there's a 33% chance I'm going to pick a given cup if they were all the same beer or I'm just picking randomly, right? But that's 
not the threshold that we use to decide if we've reached significance or not. We use p-values and we have a p-value. If it's less than 0.05, that means we have reached statistical significance. What does all that mean? What's the p-value? Well, I'm not going to get into the super dirty details of it, but we use what's called a one-tailed binomial proportions test. For for those of you who, that I'm sure most of you that just glossed you know, over your, your, your eyes there. Uh, but what that does is it determines, it, it's an equation that allows us to say uh, whether the number of people who accurately identified the odd beer out in the triangle test, whether that number is just enough over what we would expect by random chance to suggest that it wasn't just random picking at play, but that it was a, a, a likely, at least we could say with some confidence, an impact of the variable. People will often ask, uh, you know, hey, half of the people were able to get the the odd beer out. Why isn't that significant? Well, it's because there's three things there. There's three options, not just two. And the equation is the equation because it factors in things like type one error, you know, uh, false positive, false negative, stuff like that. And, it, and it's trying to do its best to kind of compress that into a nice little number that we can say, okay, look, hey, this is interesting. There does seem to be uh, that this variable does seem to have some sort of a noticeable impact. Right. And then so for if I'm if I'm taking 20 participants, uh, I've taken the triangle test. Typically, that's, I think, 11 have to get that right for statistical significance. Now, an interesting aspect of this is uh, if I'm doing a triangle test, I brewed the beer. I know what the different one is when I'm pouring the samples. I'm giving them to people to try out and all that. But you manage the whole process, right? So uh, people are filling in Google Forms and you see those. And then when I have collected enough data, you will then tell me if I'm right or not. And I, I've, a few times I've asked you, like, how is this looking after 15 participants? Is this going to be significant or not? And you won't tell me. Why won't you tell me? Because I'm a jerk, man. No, there's, uh, you know, it's, 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 I, I was trained uh, in grad school for testing with human subjects that there are so many different avenues of bias. And so as, as, trivial as I think some people view what it is that we do, we do our best to maintain professional standards. And one way to do that is to not bias the experimenter. If I were to tell you every time you ask, hey, I've got, I think I've got 15 folks, where are we at? Then it could be that you're only going to seek out maybe subconsciously those people that you seem to think have better palates or or that you, you may, you know, you might not go to your neighbor. You know, we know Norm has got an incredible palate, but maybe He's not the one who's going who's gonna to identify the Auburn out. We don't want any of that at play. So until you surpass our threshold, which is 20 tasters for an experiment minimum, uh, that is when I will say, okay, you've gotten to this point and uh, here's what the numbers look like so far. Um, and, and I'm happy to share them then. But anything less than that, it just goes against what I was trained to do, you know, as a professional scientist, albeit in the human, <laughs> in the field of human uh, psychology, uh, that we just want to stick with that because there's no reason not to. It's easy enough for us to do it. So we might as well just add a little bit more professionalism to this thing that we're doing. Now, Marshall has conducted a bunch of experiments on the triangle test, including studies on whether BJCP judges can outperform casual beer drinkers. But before we get to that, a quick word on today's sponsor, Delta Brewing Systems. Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on stainless steel brewing gear like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 litres of wort, comes with a dome lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 2 psi of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. Okay, now you have done a number of really interesting experiments related to Triangle Test that I wanted to, to cover with you. So there was a study done where you took a look at 34 experiments where 12 came back significant, also recorded who took the tests. So the categories were, there was just like general beer drinker down one end through to just someone who likes craft beer, through to home brewers, through to people who were actually either training to become a BJCP judge or are actually BJCP certified. And then you kept track of how successful they were. So. What was pretty interesting, I thought, was, first of all, if you looked at all experiments, whether they were statistically significant or not, there didn't seem to be any 
particular difference in which group was performing better? You know, for the first, those first 34, I believe those were all of the experiments we had done up to that point. And, um, and I'll, 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 I'm not going to lie about it. Uh, that was hugely motivated by the feedback we were getting from a select few folks about, you know, you need to serve these to people who are more advanced in their tasting and they have better palates and all this crap that we, you know, have come to believe isn't really that accurate. Um, and so I wanted to see for myself, okay, are my friends who are BJCP certified judges doing better than my neighbor who drinks Miller Lite all the time compared to people who are training to be in the BJCP compared to professional brewers? And and so we broke it all down. And I think at the time we'd had well over a thousand, uh, you know, tasters, you know, data points at that at that time. And so, uh, yeah, you know, it, it really did validate this idea that we say all the time or that we used to say a lot more than we do today, it seems, that yes... Somebody who is well trained in beer and brewing may have uh, an excellent ability to describe what it is they're tasting and to do it in a, in a very flowery way that sounds really pretty. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're any better at distinguishing differences, even if it's in beer, than somebody else, uh, because our palates aren't necessarily driven by the, our abilities to describe what it is we're tasting. Yeah, and what blew my mind was if you just narrowed it down to the significant results of the 12 ex significant experiments. Now, at that point, there is an odd beer out that, that a majority of people have been able to find. So I, at that point, I would expect that the more experienced you were, the better you would do. And the data shows that BJCP certified people did perform best, but only slightly better than the second place, which was just Joe Smo beer drinker. And last place in terms of performance were people who were in training to become BJCP, which I guess explains why they're in training. Dunning-Kruger in uh, full effect there, I guess. <laughs> now, now, another aspect of these triangle tests is that they are blinded. So we look the beers, we say nothing about what's in the cups, just can when you pick the odd beer out. But when I take the triangle test myself, I am semi-blinded, which is to say, I know what the variable is because I brewed the beer, uh, but... I don't necessarily know which the odd beer out cup is, so I've got to identify it, right? So why be blinded than sighted is is a question. And and I believe you actually did an experiment looking at that where you did sight some participants and blinded some others to see what the impact would be. All, all we did is after collecting our regular blinded set of data, uh, Jay Coulihan, uh, ex philosophy contributor, went and collected second sets on a couple of different experiments that he thought would might, you know, being cited, knowing the variable might have impacted the the taster's abilities. Now it was a different set of tasters, of course. Um, and in both of those, it, it didn't seem to have any impact whatsoever. Uh, part of the uh, the motivation for us to do that was because of the, the you know, expressed opinions of, a, a, again, of a few people out there who were reading our experiments who were saying, well, if you let people know what the variable is and they have any knowledge whatsoever of the brewing process, it would probably allow them to hone their focus, to hone what they're perceiving in on what they would expect from that variable being adjusted. So we wanted to see if that would be the case. And, and from our minimal experimentation on sighted, you know, triangle test data collection, it didn't seem to. Now, the last experiment you did, I just love this one. Um, because I'm accused of doing it all the time and I have never done it. I would never do it, but you did it. And that is to say that you put the same beer in all three cups and then did a triangle test. So, so I love this one. If this was a Vienna Lager and you had 10 participants, uh, there was a red, a green and a blue cup. You, from the same keg, poured that Vienna Lager in those three. And then you presented them with a survey which said, which of these beers is the odd beer out? And well, four choices, red, green, blue or no difference. Did you feel guilty about doing this, first of all? If it's innocuous and it's not going to hurt you, then I don't feel guilty about it. So so the results of this came back. 10 participants, they could have picked any of the options. The right answer was no difference. Of the 10, uh, I mean, what, 25% each maybe? So two or three should say no difference. Of the 10, one said no difference. Everybody else thought it was the red, green, or blue. What do you make of that? If you look at the spread over who thought it was red, green, and blue, it's pretty consistent with random chance. So that that supports the fact that there really is no difference. But I gave these guys the option, right? I gave them the option to say they all taste the same to me, and only one did. 
uh, which I think is kind of cool. I'm wearing their hat right now. Chrome of Brewing. I talk about them all the time. They're kind of my local watering hole nowadays. Brad Gaines, the head brewer there, is the one person who chose the, the option that they all taste exactly the same. When we go into trying to determine a difference between beers, our brains will convince us that there are differences. And I think that this data not only shows just how uh, difficult it is for us to, to taste similarities, if that makes sense, but also how hard, you know, how, how, how cemented we get in our conviction that there actually is a difference, even when, when, when one doesn't exist. Now, you throw in a real variable, mash temperature, fermentation temperature, something big in, in brewer's eyes, and, and it makes sense why someone would get kind of frustrated that they didn't taste that difference because we've been sold, you know, this, these ideas that these are very meaningful variables. And I, it's still, we're not saying they're not, but in terms of the perceptible qualities of the, the finished beer, you know, it, there's some question behind how meaningful they really are. So my last question for you, as somebody who must have done dozens and dozens of triangle tests yourself, as a trained psychologist and someone you know who who knows all the little tricks that are going on in this head game here that is picking the odd beer out is there anything i can do to improve my chances of being right next time unfortunately martin uh the best thing you can do for yourself is to get used to not being right and that's the that to me is the most psychologist response is that em embracing our imperfections is what's going to allow us to continue feeling okay with, with what we're doing here so i'll just need to get used to Embracing my all too frequent failures, I guess. I'm telling you, triangle tests, they are not easy. Now, with all of this theoretical talk about these tests, how about seeing the results of a real one from an actual experiment? Well, that's exactly what we did testing fresh yeast versus a yeast cake. And you can watch that video right here.